We are honored to have Mark Elias on the show. Mark Elias, as you know, is an attorney who specializes in election law, voting rights, and redistricting. He is the founder of Democracy Docket. Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the Midas Touch podcast. Thanks for having me. Mark, you're going to really uh, like this. So before you join, this is a two-part episode. So the first part of the episode, we spent about an hour with Gabriel Sterling talking about the Georgia SB 202. My condolences. Um, and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and Gabriel says, look, there may be parts of this bill that are inconvenient to voters, but I think I'm, I'm saying what Gabriel says, yeah. but I think that inconvenience is not voter suppression. Mark, is SB 202, is that a voter suppression bill? Yes, it is a voter suppression bill. I mean, the question I think I would ask back is why are you passing laws to inconvenience voters? I mean, set aside, set aside for a moment that I think it's much more than an inconvenience, but let's just take that at, at, at face value. The um, governor of the state said recently, admitted really recently, that this is not an anti-voter fraud bill. Okay, so, so let's take off the table that. Okay, I, I, I don't think it's an anti- I, I actually agree with Kemp. I actually don't think this addresses fraud either. So it's not aimed at fraud and it aims or it inconveniences voters. So why are you inconveniencing voters? We asked him that and I think his response was there were certain areas of the bill that he said he didn't agree with. I would have written it a different way. I had other views about it, but you know, this is definitely not doing any voter suppression. In fact, he says that this makes voting more efficient. It opens up absentee voting. Is he, is he telling us the truth there or is that uh, inaccurate again? Look, this you, he can't have it both ways, right? So you can't both acknowledge that it is that it inconveniences voters and say it's not a voter suppression bill. The fact is that inconveniencing voting voters is what voter suppression is, right? If, when yep. you make voting harder for people, fewer people are going to vote. You know, it's very easy for people like me and people like you and probably in good faith people like him to think, well, I'll vote anyway. I'll vote anyway. But you know what? For someone who is working two jobs and doesn't get time off, the difference between convenient and inconvenient is the difference between voting and not voting. The difference for an African-American voter between being, a, being able to wait on a 10-minute line or wait on a 60-minute line may be the difference between voting and not voting. The difference between having a bottle of water in the heat may be the difference between staying in line and leaving and not voting. So to say that it's inconvenience under misses the point, which is that it is the very fact that it is inconvenient that is going to cause the poor, the young and minority voters to vote less because they are less able to weather that inconvenience as part of their daily lives. And we're seeing bills like SB 202 that's not unique to Georgia. Why are we seeing these bills, Mark? across the country being implemented like SB 202, which is making both voting more inconvenient and suppressing the vote, which I agree with you are intertwined concepts for the reasons you just stated. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, under under his rationale, a poll tax is just an inconvenience. You know, I mean, like it, suppressive laws are not just things that are absolute bars to voting. Suppressive laws are things that make voting harder. Um, so why are we seeing this? We're seeing this for two reasons. We're seeing this, number one, because Republicans um, are trying to delay inevitable demographic shift uh, in the composition of the electorate. So it is no surprise that Georgia elected its first black senator ever that it voted for uh, that African-American voting strength was both at a all-time high, but also were elect to, able to elect their candidate of choice, both in that Senate race and the other Senate race and for a president. And that immediately thereafter, we see this. So one reason for this is Republicans fearing the change demographic of the electorate and rather than competing for their votes, trying to um, 
cling to a um, uh, uh, trying to fight that demographic change. The other is that they are terrified of their voters having lied to those voters now for months and months on end. They are now terrified to tell those voters the truth. You know, they allowed themselves to lie to voters in the run up to the 2020 election about vote by mail. They allowed themselves to continue to support Donald Trump's effort to overturn the 2020 election, even when it was clear uh, it was futile. Then they did not stand up to the biggest lie of all, which was that they could somehow stop the electoral uh, electoral college vote from being certified in the Capitol. And that led to um, an insurrection and death. And now those same uh, uh, cowardly legislators around the country are unable to tell those voters the truth, which is that there is no fraud. There is no need to restore integrity in election. Donald Trump simply lost the election because more voters voted for for um, uh, for uh, Joe Biden. And so instead, they are catering to that lie by continuing to suggest that somehow the election laws were insufficient. Uh, and that's a really dangerous thing for democracy. Which bills uh, and which provisions that you're seeing around the country are kind of the most concerning we should all be looking at and, and what steps can be taken to combat those? Yeah, great question. So one of the messages that I think is really important to deliver is it's not just Georgia. So Georgia is a bad law <laughs> uh, and it's a law we're suing to block. Um, but before there was Georgia, there was Iowa. Um, Iowa passed a very suppressive voting law uh, weeks before Georgia. We're also suing them that curtailed early voting, curtailed, made it harder to register, criminalized uh, activity by election officials if they help voters too much. Um, also um, uh, cut the number of days of early vote. And just because I suppose they could, they shortened election day. Like literally, they chopped an hour off of election day. So obviously, that's a law I'm worried about. I'm focused very much on Arizona, where right now the legislature is considering a series of voting um, laws that would both um, purge voters and also make it harder to vote by mail. Texas already has some of the most um, restrictive voting laws in the country, and they are introducing and considering laws that would make things significantly worse. Florida a state that actually had made progress in their voting laws, looks like they may uh, take a step back. Montana uh, is a state where, um, you know, no evidence of fraud, no evidence of regularity. The legislature there looks like it may restrict um, same-day registration on election day uh, or election day registration. So, so you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a New Hampshire uh, targeting student voting. So that's, that's probably the ones that right now, as I sit here, um, I'm most focused on. Um, but honestly, the list grows literally every day. Are you concerned, though, with the current composition of the Supreme Court and based on certain rulings that they've had recently that the audience there is not going to be receptive to challenges to these voter suppression laws and that they may allow these voter suppression laws to stand yes. once they reach the Supreme Court stage. <laughs> yes. Um, but I don't let that paralyze me. You know, I mean, the fact is the courts are what the courts are. Right. So, you know, let me say a few things about that to elaborate, though. One is that the Supreme Court doesn't take all that many cases. Right. So, like, you know, we need to keep this in perspective. The Supreme Court hears, you know, 70, 80 cases a year out of thousands and thousands. But you could broaden the question and say, do you worry about the lower courts? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so, it's not just, so it's not just the Supreme Court. But look, the job of the courts are to protect fundamental rights. And the most fundamental of all rights is the right to vote. Um, it is the right that the US Supreme Court said in the 1960s is the right that from which all other rights derive. Ultimately, if the political branches fail voters, if the political branches suppress the votes of black, brown and young voters, it is the job of the courts to step in. And so I'm not unrealistic. I'm not here to say, you know, the courts are the perfect solution. They're not. But they are there. It is their job to do the right thing. 
And so we're going to press our cases there just as we did in 2019 and 2020. We did better in 2019 and 2020 in court than people thought we would. Mm -hmm. Then frankly, I thought we would. Um, and, you know, we're going to keep pressing it. But no, it's not, I, I, you know, I worry about it every day. As you mentioned before, a, a lot of these laws seem to disproportionately affect minority voters. And I, I've seen many people, including us, including Stacey Abrams, have called these bills Jim Crow 2.0, which is a term that Sterling, when we spoke to him, took great issue with. Do you agree with that characterization of these voter suppression laws? Yes, I do. And, and in, in what ways? Just how they're, they're targeted and disproportionately affect these communities? Yeah, I mean, the fact is, you know, let's look at the, uh, the Georgia bill that mm -hmm. they are, that, that he is defending. It has new burdensome requirements for absentee voting. Now, Kemp said this is not an anti-fraud. This is not about fraud. So when you saw increased voter participation by mail, and in particular, increased voter participation by young voters and black voters um, by mail in Georgia, why do you make it more burdensome? Right? You may not want to, you may not like calling it Jim Crow 2.0. You may not like the term voter suppression, but why did you do that? when you restrict the number of ballot drop boxes. So one of the things that is frustrating to me about the way the media sometimes reports on voting, voting restriction bills is people look at the point A to point B effects of voting laws. So you say, okay, there are burdensome idea requirements for absentee voting. That is going to be suppressive. And the answer is yes, that is. Yeah. But you know what else it's gonna do? it's going to make more people vote in person, right? Because some number of people are not going to be able to meet that, are not going to be comfortable voting by mail, so they'll vote in person. Right. When you restrict drop boxes, what's going to happen? Well, more people are going to vote in person, right? Because some number of people are now not going to trust their, bail, their ballot in the mail. When you prohibit the state from distributing unsolicited absentee ballot applications, right? When you don't send applications out, what's going to happen? More people are going to vote in person. Right. So now when you look at the data of Georgia, we sued Georgia over long lines in the primary in 2020. And what they found is that if you were in a 90 percent uh, black precinct, a precinct where 90 percent or more of the voters were black, the average wait time was 51 minutes. Do you know what it was for white voters? Six. Wow. OK, so now you've taken these provisions, which in and of themselves are burdensome, to use the term that I guess he used. <laughs> um, uh, and you have and they don't just have the direct effect. They they've now just pushed more people to vote in person. And we know that there is already a huge racial disparity in the lines of in-person voting. So. That's going to increase that disparity. And then what did they do? No water and food on lines, right? So it's not just no water and food on lines in a vacuum. It's not just restricting uh, uh, drop boxes in a vacuum. It is the context by which these all work together to effectuate this. Now, the last thing I'd say about his objection is that I assume what he would say in response is that he doesn't like Jim Crow 2.0 because it connotes intentionality, okay? And here's what I'd say. In 2013, the, the North Carolina, understandably not Georgia, North Carolina Republicans passed a voting law that they too said was just a collection of things that, you know, was not intentionality. The Fourth Circuit found that that law after discovery uh, and after some uh, testimony and uh, uh, email of the state legislators came out, it turns out that the Fourth Circuit said that that law was passed, quote, with surgical precision. That's their terms, surgical precision aimed at black voters. In fact, what it turned out is that they had scored the effect of each provision on black voters. And they chose the ones that would inconvenience black voters the most while inconveniencing white voters the least. Now, that's North Carolina. That's not Georgia. And I want to be clear. I'm not saying that I have that evidence in Georgia. Right. I'm not saying that it that that it exists in Georgia. But what I can tell you is that, you know, there is recent history to suggest that state legislators understand the dynamic nature of these provisions. Right. And so, you know, count me skeptical.
And one of the things they use, I think, protecturally is, and we, and we heard this, was we need to increase the efficiencies. There are some counties that are not as effective. You know, there are some counties that are not living up to its obligations to create efficient election systems. And then, you know, when I, when I asked him, I said, well, which county are you referring to? Is there a specific county? He's like Fulton. You know, and, uh, you know, and it's obvious that Fulton, where there's a large degree of black and brown voters, you know, is the, you know, is the target. And the idea of even removing uh, election officials, which the bill permits in certain counties that are, quote unquote, inefficient, is another way of saying, how do we seize control over Fulton to preclude where Biden got most of his votes from? Yeah, I mean, obviously. And again, my question to him is, one of the things the bill does is it restricts private donations to counties to administer elections. How are you possibly going to make counties more efficient by by starving them of money? How do you make counties more efficient by taking away drop boxes? How do you make counties more efficient by limiting their ability to send out absentee ballot applications proactively? Like, how do any of these provisions we've just talked about, how do any of them make Fulton County or any other county in the state more efficient? They don't. They burden these counties. They are trying to make voting harder, and they're not trying to make these counties have the tools to make voting more accessible. And believe me, there is no one who is going to say Mark Elias is an apologist for Fulton County or any other county. I sue counties. I've sued counties in Georgia. I've sued Democratic secretaries of state. I've sued Democratic counties because I'm pro voter and I don't accept the excuse of counties and states when they say they can't do better. But this bill is not about helping counties do better. This bill is about hurting voters and robbing counties of the tools and the resources they need to do better. No doubt about it. You know, one of the things we got into with him was the idea of these bipartisan boards. And then we said, OK, well, what's the makeup of these bipartisan boards that, that you're saying? He goes, four Republicans, one Democrat. And we're like, well, you, our joke was, OK, at the end of our debate right now, we're going to hold a vote. We'll, it's going to be the three of us brothers and you, and we'll decide who won the debate by our bipartisan board and we'll see where the results land. Where do you think, where do you think we're going to end up with that bipartisan board? And so there's a lot of skepticism. There's a lot of information out there. And we just want to, you know, kind of clarify it, you know, with you. And you're the foremost expert on this. And I think, I, by the way, can I just praise yeah. you for that? Because not for the saying I'm the foremost expert, but but like that's that's a place where like language matters, right? If you tell the non-attentive public, and I'm not saying your listeners are not attentive, they're obviously listening to podcasts about politics, but most people who are not digging into the details, they hear the term a bipartisan board. And what does it conjure up in their mind, right? It conjures up in their mind it's 3-3 three, three, or it's 2-2 two, two, or exactly, it's 4-4. Four, exactly. four. So good for you in, in, in calling that out because like <laughs> that's just like, that's like nonsense. <laughs> we're like, we're like who's, who's going to win this debate here? Okay, it's going to be the three of us and you. We'll yeah. decide who won the debate. Do you think that is fair? Yes or no? And we're going to call it bipartisan. <laughs> and we're going to call it bipartisan because you're involved. That was, right. that was the whole concept. It was, it'll be, we'll call it bipartisan. We'll call it nonpartisan. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the Republicans who are going to pick them and we're going to say that they're that they're nonpartisan or that they're bipartisan. Just, it's a, it's, it's a, before we get into HR one, though, with your understanding of this bill, would the bill have allowed Trump's attempts to overthrow the election to succeed or give him more likelihood for those claims of a fraudulent election to overturn the results to succeed in 2020? Look, I think it would not have succeeded in the end because I think the courts actually were were were. Um, the courts were standing up um, uh, in that instance um, for the election results. But not every election is going to be 2020 where the candidate wins by 7 million votes. There are right. four states, you know, uh, you know, it's not down to one single state. The state is not a few hundred votes. So I always tell people elections are a matter of inches, not yards. And so it's a bad question to ask, you know, do I think that the composition of the election board matters in a 50,000 or 100,000 vote race? Probably not. You know, like I don't go that far. But boy, I just dealt with an election in Iowa with those six votes. Yeah. I've dealt with elections that are a few hundred votes, you know, and, and, and so we need to keep in mind that in those cases where you're talking about inches, not yards, who is, you know, who is the boss of the county matters. 
You know, in Florida in 2000, I'm sorry, in Florida in 2018, Andrew Gillum lost by four tenths of a percent and Bill Nelson, the U.S. senator, lost by one tenth of a percent. So a Senate seat went Republican and a, and a governor's mansion went Republican or stayed Republican. And in that in a race like that, does the who controls the county counting process and the processing matter, you know, uh, yeah, a lot more <laughs> than than it will. So, I, so I always think totally. I think looking at twenty twenty is a bad example because honestly, it wasn't that close of it wasn't an election. Yeah. 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 HR one, the For the People Act, praised by the left as like a savior of democracy, as the solution, as the antidote to these voter suppression laws, vilified on the right. What's the truth about HR one? What are the provisions? What do our listeners need to know about it, and why do we need to fight for it? So HR1 is a common sense bill that we need to pass. You know, I wish it was not the case that we needed to pass it. And a few years ago, I would not have said we needed it. The fact is that for a long time, there was a rocky but steady path towards uh, passing voter centric legislation in states. Um, and that tide has now turned hard the other way. Um, so we need HR1 because it sets minimum guide rails for states as to what voting rights need to be protected uh, in their states. It's sad that we need HR1, but at this point, it is vital to our ongoing democracy. I am worried that without HR1 and the voting provisions in it, um, we will continue to see a severe erosion of democracy that is targeted at black, brown, and young voters, and we will cease to have really anything approaching consent of the governed. I, I think your listeners can look up and try to find an instance where I have spoken out publicly in favor or against any piece of legislation. It's not something I, I normally engage myself in. Um, but in this instance, I've made an exception because it is so important for democracy. Which provisions do you think are the kind of most common sense and most important that is is kind of in defense from the, the, the right side, from the GOP side that they're attacks on it are like, why wouldn't you be for this if you weren't trying to suppress elections? Like, are there some that just stand out as like, come on, this is just so obvious? Yeah. I mean, you know, I would say that um, uh, requiring that um, states not reject. I mean, this is actually this actually ties to Georgia. So I'll give you a really good example. So lots of states had were rejecting um, vote by mail ballots and absentee ballots using really arbitrary sort of junk science signature matching standards like they were they were just like willy-nilly throwing out ballots and it and it was disproportionately impacting in a real way um uh black uh and latinx voters and young voters uh, the data was really clear so hr1 puts in place some pretty simple things like no one's ballot should be thrown out unless election officials of both parties examine the signature Right. Like, you know, like there should be training and uniform standards for that. And revolutionary voters need to be told that their ballot may not count. Now, that may seem like a simple thing. And in fact, it was so not controversial that when I sued Georgia over this, um, Georgia settled with me because Georgia was like, well, yeah, we probably do need uniform standards and we probably do need to notify voters that were that were tossing out their ballots. Uh, the Republican secretary of state settled the lawsuit with me. Donald Trump attacked that. Uh, in fact, on the infamous phone call, he is attacking the signature matching court settlement. The Republicans have, have, have vilified this. HR1 codifies that. But why, would, why wouldn't you want voters to know that their ballot isn't going to be counted because some untrained election official thought two signatures didn't match? Right. Shifting gears a little bit slightly here. So it, it's obvious that these anti-democracy news stations, the Fox News, the OANs, uh, the Newsmaxes, they help spread and propagate the big lie. They've been sued. It came out this week that, that Fox News is being sued by Dominion for like $1.6 billion for defamation. Now they go and they argue in court, oh, no, no uh, serious person believes what we're saying and is taking it as news. You know, we're an entertainment network. Well, Sidney Powell, who I think you're familiar with, also has yeah. a lawsuit against her. Uh, sort of, you know, along the same lines. Hey, you've defamed us. You spread the big lie. You don't have any proof of this. Are these lawsuits going to go anywhere? Um, are these people going to be held accountable, in your opinion? 
Yeah, look, I think that these defamation lawsuits have probably done more good than uh, than uh, than anything else in shutting <laughs> right. down the propagation of, of disinformation. You know, there was all this focus on disinformation campaigns and how to combat combat it and, you know, don't repeat the lie and the role of social media and all that. Uh, hats off to the lawyers for, for these uh, voting companies, because I think, you know, I, I think that they've had a real impact and I do think they're going to win. I mean, I think that they I think that they are going to win in their lawsuits. And I think that what is scary for the defendants is that oftentimes in a defamation lawsuit, you worry about two things. You worry that you're going to lose on the merits and then you worry about damages. And in a normal case, you say, "Okay, maybe we lose on the merits. But really, how much is it going to cost us? Like, how much did they how much how much were the brothers really harmed by me saying bad things about them? Like, right. what was it worth that, you know, people who didn't like them already didn't like them, people who liked them already liked them. Maybe they got some additional publicity for their podcasts. So what was the harm? The difference here is these these voting companies actually can show that they suffered real harm in the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. because their voting equipment has to be purchased by Democratic and Republican election officials. So I think it's a really, really significant uh, set of lawsuits that are going to have wide ranging consequences before it's all done. And what does it say like a person like Sidney Powell who then goes on to argue the the Tucker Carlson Fox News defense that no serious person can take her serious? Look, because I think that, again, um, she's got to either be able to prove that what she said was not uh, did, was not defamatory, which. I, I, I think it was. <laughs> I think I think I think her lawyers from what from what they filed, I think they think it was. Um <laughs> or that didn't cause damages. So the way, one way you get out from a defamatory statement is you say, look, it was, it, it, no one could take a, think I was serious. I'll give you an example. So if I right now said on your, uh, your podcast that you are the worst, most corrupt podcasters I've ever spoken to, <laughs> If you sued for defamation, one of the things that I'd say in defense is like, look, I, this was hyperbole. Like, no one really thinks I meant literally that you're the worst, right? right? They just think like, you know, or if I called you a crook, like no one thinks I'm actually saying you're a crook. It's just, it's hyperbole. So her defense is like, no one could think that what I was saying <laughs> was actually true. They understand it. It's just kind of like, you know, the kind of hyperbole that goes on in politics. And I, I don't think that's going to succeed, but that's, I think all she's got left to argue. I had one quick question going back to just the, the HR1 uh, piece of it. The idea of prohibiting states from requiring ID for mail-in voting. Um, there are a lot of people who say, uh, or a lot of people who are just curious out there when the, the GOP says, well, look, everybody has IDs or should have an IDs. That's not a big issue. You know, just just attach it, just write it. Like, what, what do you have to hide? Just Just do it. Why is that an issue and what's the argument from this bill's perspective and your perspective as a litigator in this area? Yeah, so look, the absentee ballot ID laws are particularly pernicious, um, and they are much, much more pernicious than in-person ID laws. I'm not a huge fan of in-person ID laws, but if you look at the litigation I bring, it doesn't tend to emphasize, except in the most egregious instances, those laws. The reason why that's different with absentee voting or mail-in voting is that you're not actually sending, you're not actually showing someone your ID. You're actually having to make a copy of it and send it in. So number one, it means you need to have a copy machine and a printer, right? You need to be able to physically do that. And most of your audience don't have home printers and copier machines. Like that is a, that is not a ubiquitous piece of technology for people. Um, and so that is problem number one. Problem number two is that, and there's a fair amount of social science on this, that people are less interested in producing a physical copy of personal identifying information than they are showing it. Right. So it's one thing to show someone your driver's license. It is another thing to send a physical copy because of risks of, of identity theft and the like. And since these IDs are now all going to be copied in envelopes that are going to be marked. So like literally it will be marked as a, as an absentee ballot, because that's, you know, that election mail is already marked by including if, 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 if 
people trying to do harm know that in each and every one of them, there is a copy of a driver's license. The risk of identity theft becomes a really, really significant one. And now how might you combat that? Oh, I don't know. You might use drop boxes, but guess what? But guess what? <laughs> they limited drop boxes, right? Like one of the ways you might say, look, we're going to solve the, that is we're not going to make people put their IDs in an envelope that goes in a mailbox that someone can take out of your driveway. We're going to put them in secure drop boxes, but lo and behold, they did that. So again, it's another example of where these provisions are reinforcing of one another. Just what about the, to the argument that, that Gabriel makes is, look, in this Georgia bill, we took out the requirement that you actually have to do a photocopy and we just make you write the actual number of the ID. Does that change anything? Mark? No, because first of all, again, same thing. People are not going to want to give put their their driver's license number in a piece of mail that can be. So even if it's not a physical copy, people are not going to want to do that. Number one. Number two is. um you're going to have a, a not insignificant number of people who transpose numbers, who don't get the digits right, you know, who misread where on your driver's license uh, the number is. You know, I'm looking for, for um, I'm not going to hold it up to the camera because I don't know whether you're, but like I look at mine and there's like, there's a number. Right. And then further down, there are places where there are, num there are other numbers. Then at the very, very bottom, on the Virginia driver's license under my signature is another number, which I actually have no idea what that number is attempting to be, but it could arguably, you could look at my driver's license and there are at least three places on a Virginia driver's license that I could argue would be the number that I would put down. And they are all different numbers. Right. No, no, no doubt about the, uh, the potential for confusion there. Mark, I, I want you to uh, have a chance to brag a little bit here. So we were watching you uh, give us the continuous count of your legal battles against Trump. Uh, what, what's your record at this point against the, uh, the Trump campaign and, <laughs> and all the election lawsuits? So in 20, so in, so we can count two ways. In, in 2019 and 2020, I was involved um, in 173 lawsuits. We won 118 of them, I think, um, in the post-election period. So starting November, you know, just looking at the Trump um, lawsuits starting post-November, um, there were 65 post-election lawsuits. Donald Trump won one of them, um, and we won all the others. Wow. <laughs> the one he won. And by the way, the one that he won, like I disagreed with him with them on the law. But uh, they the question was, how long in Pennsylvania does a voter who needs to cure a absentee ballot have? Do they have six days after the election or nine days after the election? Mm -hmm. So we the state said it was nine. Trump sued to say it was six. We defended the nine. The court said it was six. I'm not really sure how many, if anyone cured their ballot days seven, eight, and nine uh, in a presidential election. Um, it, so, I, you know, it, it, it didn't it didn't involve a material number of votes. It's like a, a, a one with an asterisk. Next yeah, to it. I, know. I mean, it's, I mean, it's kind of a weird win, right? It's like I, I know what attorney I would want to have on my side. <laughs> I'll, I'll just grow, I'll, gr growing up, growing up, the brothers and I were really competitive. And anytime one of us would win, we'd play a song. Our listeners know what we play. We are the champions by Queen. <laughs> would you play a, a song after every win or would you do something after every win? I would tweet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yes. It, it's a, it's a good it's a good way to do it. Um, Mark, where could our uh, listeners follow Democracy Docket? How could they support the movement? It was the number one question that we got when we last had a Zoom meeting. When we, we do regular Zoom meetings with our followers and our donors a lot. And the, the one thing that they said was, how could we support voting rights and fight against voter suppression? I said, it's not really our thing. I said, follow Mark Elias. Anything Mark <laughs> Elias says, do. So how, how, could, how could they follow you? How Look, could you, they can, you can, if you want to, if you want to follow Democracy Docket, you can follow it on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube at Democracy Docket. Um, you can go to the website, democracydocket.com, sign up for our newsletter. There's a place to support the website and its activities uh, there. But uh, really, the biggest thing people can do is to speak out. You know, tell your family, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, your customers, your listeners that, that voting rights matters and voter suppression is not OK, because what you guys are doing by by speaking out in the town square and saying this is not OK, you know, is is the most important thing people can do. Some people like you are going to have a big microphone. 
some people are going to have a really small microphone, but it's important that everybody does it. There you have it. Mark Elias, thank you for coming on the Midas Touch podcast. Hope to speak with you soon. Thank you very much.